I want to get straight to the lecture. I think you have received the outline or thesis that I sent around. Yes. And I want to preface this by saying, why are we talking about truth and justice again? Are these academic questions? And I would want to remind you, uh, well, last week I talked about examples that may illustrate the stakes. In principle, um, when we talk about justice, we talk about resources or access to them. Who is going to have a claim to this thing or that thing? For instance, if there is somebody who is currently living on a street corner in a tent and is being threatened with removal by the police under the new uh, ordinance and the new Supreme Court uh, decisions, does, what is this person entitled to? What is he or she owed as a matter of justice? Truth is related because after all, Justice is not just something that happens between people. It resolves, evolves, revolves around institutions, many of which are ultimately backed by the power of the public or government. They operate with a set of laws um, where the question of what is the facts of the matter is important. Um, and that is ultimately decided not just by police rarely has to do anything to do with that, but rather the legal system, at least ideally, to apply um, logic and reason to establishing what needs or what, what claims were uh, denied or fulfilled and what somebody is, in fact, legally entitled. Yeah. Sorry, the outline. Oh, um, I posted it yesterday and I ticked the box that said send notification. Did that not get sent? This way? Yes, I week three. Yes. I am sorry. I guess I should make sure to send a separate announcement. Did anybody get notified at all that I posted this? It wasn't notified. Yeah, one person got notified. I guess that's it. I mean, that's not good enough. So next time I'll send an announcement. It's right there in the folder. Sorry, but you can read along since I'm more or less going to follow this list of theses for my argument. So again, when we're talking about truth and justice, we're talking about material circumstances and entitlements, rights that may be um, enforceable by political power. And if they're not being enforced, then maybe you have ways of, um, of making that happen. But for that, you need a standard process by which court, for instance, establishes what is the truth, what are the facts of the matter. Incidentally, I see there are two of you. Last, your faces are something to look at for sure, but for medical reasons, I would ask you. So, but it's not just like last week, we talked a little bit about what is this concept of truth, what is the concept of justice, what might we need it for, what difference does it make? I also want to ask, is there a relation between the two? And in fact, does a specific concept of truth follow from a specific concept of justice or vice versa or both? So to get into the concept of truth first, um, starting with Aristotle, Philosophers have argued that there is a correspondence between a statement and the reality it describes. And that, if that is met, if that criterion is met, then a statement is truthful. And that also presumes that you can know what another person is thinking through their words. You can know what things in the world are. So it is a large um, to a large extent dependent on an assumption that the process of knowledge creation is transparent. Anybody could be a participant in it. You don't need any special access um, in order to, to play. There's also the formal, which is to say logical criteria, that a statement has to be free from contradictions. So it can be one thing and a different thing at the same time. It can be not the one thing and that thing. It has to be 
free of contradiction. And this is not just a matter of the thought itself being coherent, but also if it isn't, then probably you're not describing the thing in terms that make sense. So in this first formulation, there is the assumption that the thought, the word we have for it, and the thing itself are um, identical, that there is a, a match between these things. And that's not bad for a start. But um, as philosophy progressed, people pointed out various problems with this, um, with the, with the, especially with the question of how do we determine one thing to be part of this category of things and that thing part of another, especially if we have the assumption that everything falls into one category system where all individual things partake of one common essence of being. And how exactly do you determine where that total essence splits up into individual things? How do you tell, what was the example again, the donkey from the philosopher? What is it that makes the specific difference there on an essential level? So for uh, high medieval Christian scholasticist like Aquinas, the um, idea was rather that now he sees the thing and the concept as a different, as two different things. They're not identical. They can't be identical. Um, there is some mediation that has to happen between them, although the thinking is reflective, is adequate to the thing. So mediated though it may be, it is now no longer an identity. Think about it more like a mirror image, perhaps, um, or a mental image, which isn't mirrored. But how, if that is the case, if, you, if it's too simple to say the word and the thought of the thing are the same as the thing, um, then if that is not the case, then the question is to what extent and by what means do you get to this correspondence of statement and reality that Aquinas still thinks you can have? Um, and so since Aquinas didn't answer that, this is left to subsequent philosophers to figure out how can we clearly state this is the right way of making sure that the word we use is adequate to the thing we want to describe. Um, when we get to the 18th century and the Enlightenment and subject philosophy, notably Hegel, who we will be reading soon, their um, approach to this problem, how do we get the thing and the word together, is to operate from the thinking subject, the human who has the thought, is the one who has to make sure that there is as much correspondence as possible between his thought and the thing. And the way to make sure of that is to apply reason, say Kant and Hegel, which is to say you become aware of how your thinking works, the faculties of your mind, and you make sure that you make the best use of them in a way. There is a different way in which philosophers of this age have also tried to tackle the same problem. Um, for instance, to say it is an agreement. It is not, in fact, completely determined that this word describes that thing, but rather we agree on that. We come to a, a gentleman's agreement that will set it to mean that thing. Um, so that's another one. Or with Marx, you could also say that the way that you achieve correspondence is by figuring out that it works. If we treat the thing by a concept that makes these assumptions about it, and it does what we want, um, and we get results, then that is the proof that the concept is valid. So it's a praxis question. But of course, if you work with an object and therefore need to know how it works and understand it, um, doesn't mean that thinking and doesn't enter into it. So praxis too has a strong component of thinking, of course. And as we said last week, as we established last week, when Hegel talks about um, the active process of work of a subject working with an object, that too is a mix of thinking about it, but also um, obtaining it and 
working through it, and so forth. Although it's mostly metaphorical. But it's still left open, though, with these attempts to come to a clear definition of the exact way in which object and subject relate, or thing and word, is um, whether we can always get to the very essence of the thing. If all of existence, all of being, is accessible to our thinking and can be described. Um, and this is not just about unanswerable questions like, is there a God? Or, you know, how, why are we here? But even about more simple things. Is there an essence of, of tree that goes beyond what we understand by, by wood or the living tree? Um, or isn't there? Or does it matter? So for Immanuel Kant, the German Enlightenment philosopher, um, whose essay, What is Enlightenment? He find it as the exit of humanity from its self-incurred state of dependency. Um, was a dependency as in, you know, to be somebody's dependent that you can contain for tax purposes. Um, Kant's answer is that the thing in itself remains unknowable, and that's fine. Like, we can't ever get to that most, the, the innermost core of things. Um, and really, why would we? Do we need to? Um, that's not for us to know. Now, Hegel, on the other hand, says that once you have figured out all the determinations of a concept, then you know the concept. So if you have made sure that you have done justice to the actual material of your thought, that your thought is free from contradiction, that you're aware of how your thinking works. Um, in other words, if you check off all the levels of reflection and self-reflection necessary in the thinking process, then you're good. Then you have a valid concept. And we'll see exactly how he does that when we get to his determinations of the state or right or what kinds of rights when we read the philosophy of writing. Um, and another school of thought that wants to, to get rid of the problem of whether or not we know what makes things tick from the inside, empiricism says that it's our senses, the observation, which is data fed to us by the thing, by means of our senses. That's how we know what it is. We can describe it and say it has a weight, a color, a specific density, whatever else. So it's very much what you might consider science is proper, natural science. Um, empiricism. Since all these are ultimately speculation, because whether or not there is a thing that is unknowable, if there is, well, we wouldn't know about it, would we know? Um, other philosophers have simply argued that this is a foolish quest, and that instead we can ditch this attempt to come to, ne never mind the congruence between word and thing, or thought and thing, uh, nor even adequacy. Really, what we should admit, and this is language philosophy, going back to Wittgenstein and then Saussure, is to say that the concept is an arbitrary signifier for the thing. It is something that we throw at it, and that's that. We can't even say it's valid because it sticks. Uh, we operate with it for sure, but it's on a much, much thinner basis um, than to say it's adequate, it is congruent, or what have you. What happens, however, is that because we operate through the medium of language, the way that our thinking is put together and articulates itself is language, which is a system the language philosophers claim they do understand the logic of which they can fully explain. Well, there you have an internally coherent logical system then to explain that part of our thinking that take language form. And if you can explain that the concept has a place in that and that it can be recognized as the right word for a thing, um, 
and represent. And if the thing can be represented with that concept, maybe that's good enough. Maybe that is all we need. So at that point, the question of truth really stops being relevant. Or it is not a correspondence theory or a reflection theory anymore, but really just a matter of recognition. If everybody thinks this is what it means, if everybody agrees that this sounds about right, um, then that's true enough for the purpose. And yet, this type of language philosophy still sticks to an idea that the language system is coherent, has to be coherent. So um, it doesn't suddenly and arbitrarily change meaning over time. It doesn't just suddenly yank one word out of usage and replaces it with another. Um, so what happens then is that while your concepts no longer relate firmly to other thing, the two things, they do still relate firmly to other concepts. So in that system, although it is all ultimately arbitrary signifiers, the words are, with no essential connection to things, nevertheless, um, once set in place, they mean the same thing and they have a stable connection to each other. And finally, because the main point here is for me to criticize postmodern or post structuralist thought. And of course, the reason behind it is that this is the dominant paradox in the social science and generally in the liberal public. Like I said before, no, it doesn't mean that everybody is walking around with a copy of Foucault or Butler um, from which they cite, but rather it is handed down, semi-processed, um, popularized versions of their philosophies that have been built into a new um, dominant paradigm of ideological predispositions among this educated middle class. Um, so, but for that reason, when I first developed the basic structure of this argument that was 25 years ago, when this stuff was mostly still on the right. So what I've seen since then is, in spite of the fact that it makes no sense, or perhaps especially because it makes no sense, but it serves a certain function, that it has gone from a challenge to other ideas to being the only game in town that is um, has many of the faculties of a bowl of jello that if you're trying to nail it to a wall, you're going to find out it's very good at moving this way and then um, and resisting critique because it is so flexible in its evasiveness. So now back to the timeline after this aside, um, what does postmodern or post structuralist philosophy contribute to this development of the way we have been thinking about the relationship between words and things, about the concept of truth. Um, the postmodern modernists, Foucault especially, don't even assume a closed system of language anymore. So the structuralists and language philosophers um, did assume that, and Foucault and especially psychologists who are working in that same philosophical um, school say that meanings, thoughts, language, and all that themselves too are completely um, fragmented and shattered, temporary, historically contingent, um, and therefore can and will change over time, sometimes suddenly, and in fact, are also ultimately constructed at random. Um, which is why at some point in the 1990s and early odds, there was such an enthusiasm for multiple personality disorder among people who were interested in studying philosophy as the existence of this disorder seemed to make the case of the discontinuity of identity. There is nothing there that defines even you as the subject. It is all just like a big old broken kaleidoscope of floating signifiers that may mean one thing now and a different thing tomorrow, but there is nothing firm to hold it together. 
we can't really say anything that's true. So don't ask people to tell the truth. Don't ask whether something is true. It is an obsolete concept. Why did we even get to use it in the first place? Why? It's the enlightenment that came up with this notion that you have to always ask, how do you know this is true? Who told you this? Did you see it? What happened then? How do you know that's how it happened? And all those kinds of things, you know, the modern process of inquiry, scientific and otherwise. So, no, that's post structuralism. The Enlightenment is an inherently repressive project. And the biggest bludgeon in its arsenal of repression is this demand for truth and scientific knowledge. Because if you look at it, what is so different between, on the one hand, mindset that wants to insist on a universalist, unitary system of thought against the criteria of which everything in the world has to be measured on the one hand, and on the other hand, the repressive system of imperialism set up by Western elites who want that every person in the world, no matter how distant from these power centers, no matter how different and completely incompatible with their way of life and thinking, has to prove their worth in comparison to some Western Christian white male standard of personhood. So the, the trick of post-structuralism is to argue and convince people that this is the same thing. There is no room between the operation that says, I am here as Her Majesty's or His Majesty's representative, and I'm going to build a Christian school based on the old Christian principle of caning and telling you your culture is garbage so that you may work in the cotton fields. That this is somehow the epitome of the project of the Enlightenment that went up to rulers and said, please explain to me why you think that this war is necessary and justified by the word of God, because from where I'm sitting, it looks like a big slaughter fest that costs people money. So if you can convince yourself that these are the same operation, congratulations, you might get tenure. Um, <laughs> so the enlightenment, there is nothing in between the enlightenment and the power interests of Western elites. It's the same exact thing. So if you want people to tell the truth, if you think there is a truth to statements, if you think there is one truth at all times, that must be consistent and must relate to something in the world and that is not constantly left open for debate, I guess you're with those people. Um, because ultimately, if you want liberation, if you don't want to dominate in the world, if you want people to be free, you have to start with the deconstruction of these traditional enlightenment ways of thinking. And nothing closer to the core of enlightenment thinking than the demand to make sense and to be truthful. So you ask somebody to tell the truth, um, it's basically to deny that person the right to be a separate individual with rights and so forth. Now, to move from this on to the concept of justice, um, or maybe since this is another bigger point in the, in the outline, first, any questions about this first one? Yes. Um, I always like heard from people that postmodernism and Marxism are connected, but it seems like they have two completely different ideas of how to come up with the truth. Am mm -hmm. I interpreting what you're saying? That's right a great there? question. Who says that postmodernism and Marxism are connected? A lot of conservatives. <laughs> yes, indeed they do. I have read, I think I mentioned this before, I'm not ashamed to admit this, know your enemy. I read James Lindsay's book, um, in which she argues against postmodern, about the like dumbed down popularized version of postmodernism. He argues this because he wants a version of 
hard science. He wants to defend a version of hard science that allows him to come to the conclusion that transgender people are not really human. So that is something you have to bring to reading that book, of course. And he hadn't fully come out with that political position at the time he wrote it. Um, and he's radicalized since then. But the point is this. Um, he says, why do people take these postmodern positions? Why do they destroy the life of the mind? Because they're cultural Marxists. Now, that is the point he merely states. He makes arguments throughout the book. He states this as fact, without proof, and without argument, three times throughout the book, saying, and ultimately this is because of Marxism, because Marx also wanted to tear down the natural order of things. And so that's why this is the same thing, except by other means. Uh, certainly that is extremely far-fetched. So if I want to take a person like that seriously for that part of the argument, where they point out the real contradictions of liberal slash identitarian post-structuralist thought about identity, sex, gender, and so forth, um, I think I wouldn't want to do that at this point. Like I do not want to there are other people you can engage on that subject than somebody who's instrumental on it. But on the other hand, do I need to close ranks with identitarians who are saying what Lindsay proves is that if you do not agree with us in all reading of epistemology that I just criticized, then I guess you also want transgender people dead. So you're one of them. So this is a bit of a bind. If you have a political and philosophical ideology that you recognize as a Marxist, as bogus, and if you criticize it, um, you end up having to explain, and I'm happy to explain it, you know, but you're suspicious of uh, being one of those people. That's a problem. It's not my problem, you know. But no, Marxism is the traditional, and I would say oldest enemy of post structuralism. Going back to Sartre in the 1950s, who I think I mentioned before, wrote about Foucault that the ultimate point of Foucault's system of thought was anti-communist. It's like the last, the last uh, battalion being brought into the battle against communism by the losing forces of the bourgeoisie. Um, looks like they did quite well. But um, it is true beyond what Sartre himself might have thought in the 90s. Um, second, David Harvey, who wrote The Conditions of Postmodernity in 1985 or 1987. And it was a efficient, an efficient takedown of identitarianism even then. Um, of liberal politics that focus very strongly on identity, explicitly to the exclusion of question of class. One of his examples includes a fire in a chicken processing factory in South Carolina that killed dozens of black women, working class women. You haven't heard about it, and the press did not report about it because it happened at the same time. And they had some one local paper they still existed at the time, had one guy on it who reported about it and asked the same question. Why is nobody writing about this? Like, we always learned the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1912. That was the big um, call to action for workplace safety. Fire, the reason there is fire escapes all over New York City, it's a defining architectural feature of the city, is because of this fire. Nobody is um, giving a damn about these dead black workers. Well, at the same time, the, um, the Clarence Thomas hearings were going on in Washington. And the entirety of the press was busy reporting on those. Not to diminish um, the legitimacy of Anita Hill's complaints or the complicity of Joe Biden as the chair of this committee in getting Clarence Thomas confirmed on the Supreme Court and willingness to look past uh, Credible allegations, not just by Hill. Um, the point Harvey is making is 
this shows the class basis of liberal identitarians. Yes, they are about um, race and gender and so forth. But they're also very much not paying attention to that when they come to the working. So, um, but it's not just that. It's also a philosophical argument based on his reading of Marx. There's another Marxist British philosopher or literature, literature scholar, Terry Eagle, who also wrote a book. There is Adolf Reed Jr., um, who stands in the tradition of black Marxism in connected to the Frankfurt School out of Germany, who early on and, and viciously argued against all favorite positions of postmodernism, post-structuralism, and so forth. As a consequence of which, he was uninvited from a panel discussion on race at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement that was being hosted by the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, the group that gave us Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for instance, if you hadn't known. Um, and he was run out of Adolf Reed, Virginia was run out of town on a rail as a transphobe, racist right-winger. Um, and, you know, that shows you how much room there is for a leftist critique of this centrist position. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Other questions? All right, well, let me try and get back into the flow of the argument then. This was a, was a worthwhile detour, I thought, but um, it did kind of take me off the main road here. So um, I wanted to argue that there is a determinate, specific uh, meaning to the concept of justice. Um, it's not an abstract thing. It's not an arbitrary thing. And not just that, but also there is a relation between a specific valid concept of justice and a specific valid concept of truth, and you can't have one without the other. So what is justice? Um, it is precisely the absence of arbitrariness. Justice is if I don't tell you that you're getting an A on your paper, only then to give you an F. Justice, for instance, is if two of you turn in equally good papers and I get, give both of you the same grade for them, or when I hold all of you to the same standard for instance, that I don't decide to divide the class down the middle by an arbitrary line and say, I'm going to mark down all of you on this side 20%, and I'm going to give you an additional 20% because I can. You might complain that that is unjust um, because you want to be treated one equally. So that, however, raises the question of who or what is equal to whom or to what. And um, then also, what do you do when you have individual situations or situations in general that are impossible or difficult to compare? What if somebody has different circumstances? Um, so when people will say, I'm sorry, I could not come to class today, I would like to not be marked absent. You do not treat that equally and therefore not justly if you allow it or deny it as an excused absence, sight unseen. In that case, justice does seem to demand to ask, and why was that? And if it was you know, something that resembles an excusable situation, say, here's the tow truck receipt from my broken down car, or here's the ER record, showing that I was there with a broken leg or whatever, you know, you might want your absence excused. Or vice versa, if I say that I have absolutely no excuse policy, if you're absent, you lose points. I don't care if your leg was broken. And if you had to bring your grandmother to the hospital, and if your cat just died, you know, 
while your car was getting stolen. Not my problem. You might also think that's not just. I draw the line at three grandmother deaths per semester. <laughs> Everything beyond that, I'm starting to get suspicious. So, uh, but are there absolute criteria for what would be just? And if so, where might we try to find those criteria? Um, so again, let's turn to our history of philosophy and religion to see who thought about this first, and maybe we can save ourselves some of the trouble. Going back to Aristotle, who already who would have known, distinguished two different kinds of justice. One, and I should have looked up what these what terms they use in the English discourse. I translated them from the German, but I think it makes sense to say that one is equivalent, and the other is distributive justice. Equivalent being when you have a contractual relation pretty much between people who are legally equal. So in that situation, if I say I will pay you 10,000 drachmas for your chariot, and then the deal takes place and the promised goods and money change hands, then that was um, a just exchange, an equivalent exchange in a marketplace. But there's also the situation where you want to be in, in what you dole out, what you give to people. Um, you want to be adequate to the differences in their situations, to their personal qualities, to their station, to their health, age, level of education, or whatever. Um, to the needs, especially. So here, the point would be not to treat people equal to everybody else, but rather in distributive justice, it is you do justice to the specific situation. Um, I might tell a member of my family to go and get themselves something to eat because I'm, I'm busy and they should figure that out. So they figure that out by now if they're hungry in between major meals, which wouldn't be a problem. But if I told that to a baby, you know, or a toddler without the skills or without the, you know, the conceptual framework, that would be really bad parent. And um, it would probably also have constant legal consequences if anybody ever found. Um, so there you have plenty of examples you know, how you might want to treat people differently. This might come in once, you know, if you're thinking, if you've read Kimberly Crenshaw and you think thought about critical race theory, what if people enter this situation where they're treated as legal equals, but where they don't enter that as actually, as actually, um, because they have not been provided with the same resources. Does, do we somehow apply something other than, um, you know, the one principle of law, which is equivalent, is there room in our law for distributive justice that tries to, um, to even out inequalities. Now, why is there even a standard like this? Who agrees on that standard and applies it? In Aristotle, this is contingent on a time and place. It's about an institutions and history. It's about Athenian citizens who, in their dealings with each other, are supposed to or have been observed to, um, to act on these principles. Another example of a limited community in which specific principles of justice are applicable are religions. Judaism, for instance, assumes that you obtain justice through God to the extent that you are part of the covenant between God and the chosen people, the chosen people, and not just that, but you also follow the law, God's law. So at that point, it is clear that the source of justice is external to the human community. Justice comes from God. God sees to it that justice be done. But um, while Aristotle didn't admit that he was limiting his insights to Athenian citizens, uh, for Judaism, it's clear. This applies to people who are part of the tribe, and 
who are living according to God's um, law. So, but given that, which is not that big a precondition to ask for, you will have justice. And Christianity likewise says it is God who is the source of justice. If justice is done, then that's God's will um, being enacted, regardless what means he might have, like who he might work to others. But it's always God's justice that is being done. Why? Ultimately, this is this rests on the sacrifice that Jesus made or has been made of. Um, so through his death and resurrection is the, uh, the purging of original sin and the establishment of a broader covenant where God's justice applies to all humans, no longer just to the ones that were part of the chosen people. And you're not even bound to following the traditional law laid down by Moses anymore, but rather all that is required of for inclusion in this community that gets to have these benefits is to believe that Jesus was God's son and is your savior. So if you believe in the death and resurrection subsequently of, of Jesus, you are a Christian and you receive justification through that. So it's a little bit different. Um, it is broadened and the standard is lower for access. In Christianity. Um, in Judaism, it's still required to follow the law. In Christianity, you can potentially, um, you know, um, give the finger to the law your entire life and receive, um, what's it called, absolution on your death. It's man's relation to God that matters, not really man's relation to other men, which the laws uh, imply. So, as Christianity developed, and as the practices of government that Christians actually had to do develops, um, one of the great intellectuals of Christianity, again, Aquinas, goes back to Aristotle, as they were doing at that time in the High Middle Ages, and introduces a third angle to his system of justice, which is legal justice. So to say, um, there is, and this kind of goes back to Judaism, right? It says there is a kind of justice that involves um, an obligation of the individual to the community, and that takes the form of following the law, doing what the law requires you. Um, but who's behind the law? In this case, this is not the law of the Old Testament that comes from God to Moses. It is still law that is enacted with reference to divine right, but it's clearly the law that comes from secular rulers. So um, this is the first time really uh, since you know, Athens as a political community that that aspect comes back into in Aquinas, that you have to somehow live by standards the government, the state, your secular ruler sets for you. Um, and in a way, that becomes also a formula available to enlightened absolutist governments like Frederick II, the Great of Prussia, who was a big fan and in fact like corresponded with Voltaire and also Kant, um, saw himself as somebody who wanted to use his power to bring individual freedom to, in, to people under his rule. Uh, but his, his formula was, uh, think as much as you want, but obey. So here, really, the, the basic foundation of it all is you have a king. That's a fact of life. The king gives you laws. Follow them. Everything else is kind of up for grabs. You know, you can think about other things, like mentally speaking. doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Um, but he is, of course, also an enlightened absolutist. So it is by no means clear that a king that says, follow my laws, if you do nothing else, that's what you need to do, is going to be a benevolent ruler who, who thinks he's going to use the laws to free you from yourself and uh, a self-encouraged 
dependency, like for Frederick did. Um, which leads me back to Immanuel Kant, who also dove into the question of what justice might actually mean. Um, and he wanted to go back to absolute standards of justice as well. He wanted to say, find ways in which we can say this specifically is exactly what um, people are meant to do or not to do. But he also realized from this enlightenment basis that you can't turn to nature or to God to find the answer. Like they're not going to tell you, there's not going to be an answer there um, where you could uh, ask for absolute standards. You have to figure it out for yourself. So <laughs> nevertheless, or at the same time, if you don't turn to some exterior power where you can convince yourself that your behavior and your, and your disposition morally, legally, and so forth speaking, is set from the outside by a, by a compelling force like nature or God, then what's going to stop you from murdering your neighbor, um, you know, and coveting his wife and doing all those things that the Christians will still argue if you haven't accepted God, you're going to do those things because to accept the foundation of morality in God is really the only firm basis. I mean, outside of philosophy, secular philosophy, that of course is still around it. But for Enlightenment thinkers, that was not um, a thought they thought worth thinking. But because of this human arbitrariness, what's going to keep me from doing whatever I want if I know? God and nature won't force me otherwise. There is simply nothing there. Um, how do you solve that if you really think people need firm um, rules, firm guidelines as to what they can and cannot do? Is there anything that gives us a determinate content of what the law might be? Or do we even need to have that kind of determinate content? Um, and I think I'm going to wait to address this because I have multiple answers by different people that I want to uh, walk through. And we have two minutes left in today's class. So I think I'm going to move that part to Friday.